Um, okay. Uh, they told us to wait like three or four minutes uh, after uh, 12, uh, well, 12.30 for me, 2.30 at the, uh, in the, the meeting schedule. Um, before getting started, uh, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Tim Alderetti, and I am the debate coach, or a debate coach at the Meadows School in Las Vegas. Uh, I've been coaching for about uh, 31 years. I started out coaching in uh, Chicago, uh, and then I moved to uh, Grand Rapids and coached there for a while before moving out to uh, Las Vegas. I've taught uh, at the Michigan Debate Camp, and as a matter of fact, this lecture uh, is based on a lecture I have given at the Michigan Debate Camp many, many times. So uh, this is a, a subject I, I, I am... Uh, uh, I, I strongly feel about. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. What I'm the way this lecture is going to work is I'm going to share the uh, I'm going to share the PowerPoint with you. There will be times uh, during the lecture where uh, I'm going to either uh, stop and ask for questions if you have questions, um, or uh, there's a little bit of participation where you ask a few questions uh, like you would in a cross-examination and then we break those down. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with, let's get this up. All right. Uh, cross-examination should be the best part of debate, right? Uh, it's the part that looks the most like normal uh, to people who are not involved in debate. And in a good cross-examination, uh, all sorts of important things occur. You lock down what your opponent has said and what they haven't said, so they can't wiggle out of it. it uh, a good cross-examination begins the process of comparison uh, between your arguments and their arguments, your warrants and their warrants, your evidence and their evidence. A good cross-examination is where you build ethos, uh, where you build your credibility uh, with the judge. Um, a good cross-examination, I like to think, is where you start building up speaker points. Uh, because it's the time in the debate where you're speaking at a normal tone of uh, a normal pace, where the judges can understand everything that you say, and you can and you get to demonstrate your critical thinking skills directly by closely examining uh, some of their arguments. So cross examination should be the best part uh, of uh, debate. Unfortunately, cross examination is often not, uh, very much not, the best part of a uh, debate. Uh, lots of things happen in cross-examination that make it uncomfortable or unproductive or confrontational uh, or simply uh, more prep time. You know, people use it to uh, essentially uh, prepare their speeches or ask what their opponent said or things like that. And don't get me wrong, you should use cross-examination to clarify some points, but that but you want to move beyond that into doing some of the good stuff during cross-examination. Um, there, uh, there was a debater, I taught a uh, lab with her at uh, the Michigan debate camp, Corey Stoughton. Uh, she debated at the University of Michigan. And uh, she told me her goal in cross-examination was to make boys cry. Uh, which, okay, that's a little bit uh, far, but uh, her goal was to win arguments during cross-examination, to make it so that their opponents could not recover from it. Uh, I remember when uh, I was helping coach the Northwestern team, and we uh, uh, sometimes would debate against a debater from Iowa, Andy Ryan. And our team said, we can't go for the politics disadvantage against Andy Ryan. We can't even run it because we don't want to look stupid in cross-examination. We know he's going to tear us apart on it. And so we can only run quality arguments against him. Otherwise, we're going to look terrible in uh, cross-examination and maybe we'll never recover from it. Um, those debaters, I think, who do the best 
in cross-examination are the ones who take it to its useful end. They're aggressive about promoting their arguments uh, and examining their opponent's arguments in cross-examination. Now, I don't want that to be confusing. Uh, good cross-examinations go on the offense. They are offensive because they go uh, they go onto their opponent's ground and start to take apart their opponent's arguments. Bad cross-examinations are offensive. They uh, are rude. Uh, they are where you're so aggressive that you're, uh, you know, you're demeaning your opponent. You are not letting them talk. You are insulting uh, to your opponent. And so what I would like to do today is talk about how you can do the good parts of uh, debate, uh, cross-examination, without going so far as to do the bad parts of cross-examination. I want you to be offensive, not offensive. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to talk about the good parts of cross-examination, the bad things that people do during cross-examination, and then the ugly things, the things that turn debate uh, on its head and you want to avoid at all costs. Um, unfortunately, the, the order for that made no sense whatsoever in terms of giving the speech. So I'm going to reverse the order and go uh, the ugly, the bad, and the good. Uh, it, it, the, it's a spaghetti western, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm a boomer, so that's one of my favorite movies. Uh, and so in Italian, it is Il Bruto, Il Cattivo, and Il Bueno. So we're going to start out with the ugly, Il Bruto. There are things you can do during cross-examination that will turn the debate against you because they will offend the people in the room. Uh, and one of the most important and most common ones is when you are talking over someone else. You're answering the question and your opponent has heard your answer and wants to ask another question, but you keep talking and talking and talking, and they're politely trying to get you to move on, uh, but you keep talking. Or the converse, uh, where you know you don't allow your you're asking questions, you don't allow your opponent to, the time to even answer them. You give them a question, they start to answer. You move on to another question, you cut them off, etc. If you're talking over someone, what you're communicating to the judge is two things. First, you're communicating that you think that only what you say matters, that only your voice is important. And the second thing is, is that you're communicating to the judge that you're afraid to let your opponent talk because what they might say is going to ruin your argument. So you, you, uh, you display arrogance and cowardice at the same time whenever you talk over someone else during cross-examination. Um, sometimes uh, people move uh, beyond that into insults, insults and demeaning language. Um, there are lots of times when male debaters will uh, talk down to female uh, debaters during the cross-examination. Uh, this is a stereotype, but it's a stereotype with a lot of truth behind it, that there are many times where uh, women debaters feel that they have been cut off in cross-examination the way a man would not be cro uh, cut off in uh, cross-examination. And that's demeaning, and that's uh, offensive, and that's going to both hurt your points, and you're going to make debate uh, not a very pleasant place to be uh, for people to debate. And uh, you, I mean, you don't want to be a jerk during cross examination, and that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of being a jerk. Lots of people like to throw in little insults or digs. Uh, you know, my opponent obviously has not read all of the libidinal economy uh, literature that I have. Or do you even know what your affirmative case... I mean, do you really think you're getting anywhere by throwing in ad hominem attacks? Uh, if you have taken it so far that what you are doing is uh, uh, marginalizing someone else in a debate... Uh, then I think the judge should step in and tell you uh, to knock it off because that is, uh, you know, 
That's that makes debate a very uh, uncomfortable place, and it makes cross examination uncomfortable to watch. Cross examination is it's oftentimes a battle over who can control it, and in in the real world, most of the time, this is done in good faith. It's just the person asking questions wants to ask questions and the person answering questions wants to answer those questions. And how do you know when you've gone too far? How do you know uh, if you've answered the question for too long? How do you know if you've cut someone off uh, too quickly? What do you do? when your opponent won't stop answering uh, the question. And that's a hard balance uh, to find. Uh, you know, the, you don't want to be rude, but you also don't want to be, uh, you know, let your opponent take over the entirety of the cross-examination. A couple of things you can do in this situation. First, uh, decide whether asking the same question again is going to get a different answer, right? Like I've watched lots of times where people will ask a question, the person answers it, they ask that same question again and say, you didn't answer me. And it goes on a couple of times and you got to ask yourself, am I going to get a different answer? And if you're not going to get a different answer, move on. I got it as a judge. I understand they didn't answer the question or maybe I think that they did and now you're really in trouble, but there's no point in doing it beyond the point uh, where you're not going to get a different answer. Uh, with regards to cutting someone off, you know, there are ways that you can do it with humor, with politeness. You could say, excuse me, I've, I, I understand that answer. Now, I do have more questions. I'm running out of time, etc. cetera. Uh, a little bit of humor, you know, goes a long way and politeness goes a long way. But that's not always going to work. There will be times where your opponent keeps talking uh, regardless of how polite you are about that. And to be honest, after a certain point, they're the one that looks bad. Uh, and uh, there's no point in getting into a fight uh, over it. You do want to be assertive, but you don't want that assertiveness to lead to a conflict. Uh, so now I'd like to move on from the things that make cross-examination ugly uh, I want to move on to the things that people do in cross-examination that uh, are bad. But before doing that, I want to answer any questions people might have uh, about uh, the ugly. Do you have any questions about uh, anything I've said so far? You can put them in the chat. You can ask for audio permission uh, and ask it out loud. Uh, if, if you come up with a question or you think of a question while I'm talking, just go ahead and put it in the chat and then I will I will get back to answering that as soon as uh, I get back. Okay, well, then let's move on to uh, the bad. All right. Um, there are times when it's not rude, it's not offensive, it's not dismissive or marginalizing, but it's still pretty bad. Uh, I have watched a lot of debates, like a lot, a lot, a lot of debates, uh, like way more than anyone you know. Uh, and so I've seen things. I've seen a lot of cross-examinations, uh, and some of them are just chock full of uh, bad habits and uh, uh, mistakes and things like that. Uh, and so I've got uh, a lot of issues with those and I'm going to go over them now in excruciating detail uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a rant. And we're going to start out with uh, one of my least favorite questions in cross or uh, comments in cross-examination where someone says, it's my cross-examination. Uh, and they're usually, you know, someone's asking a question and then the other person asks a question back and they say, it's my cross-examination. Um, to be perfectly honest, it, it's first of all, factually not true, right? It's your cross-examination to ask questions. It's their cross-examination to answer a question. So together, that makes it both of your cross-examinations. But more importantly... Uh, there are a lot of times uh, where it's just 
helpful, uh, you know, to ask a question. If they've asked a question, you're unsure what that question means, you know, you can ask them a question. And so asserting, it's my cross-examination. That's a way of uh, kind of dismissing, uh, being dismissive uh, and not being very helpful in terms of moving the uh, the, the cross-examination forward. The second one that I absolutely hate is it's a yes or no question. Almost inevitably, when someone says it's a yes or no question, it is very definitely not a yes or no question. A well-written, well-thought-out yes or no question doesn't need for you to tell them that it's a yes or no question. I've seen many, many things that were Absolutely not. Yes. Okay. On the immigration topic, um, uh, people were, they were talking about Cuba and they were trying to run the shunning uh, argument. So the negative in cross-examination of the 1AC asks, is Cuba a good country? And the affirmative, you know, starts to say, well, the affirmative improves relations and blah, blah, blah. And then Ed cuts them off and goes, no, no, no. It's a yes or no question. Is Cuba a good country? Well, that's definitively not. Uh, a yes or no question. Uh, I watched uh, one cross-examination. The negative stands up and says, uh, would you uh, say that your affirmative is performative? And the negative, or the affirmative says, I didn't say anything uh, about performance. Uh, and then that goes, okay, well, is performance good or bad? Uh, and the negative says, look, uh, I don't know what you, how you want me to answer that. And he goes, it's a yes or no question. Uh, and so the F goes, um, yes. And the neg says, what? Uh, not a yes or no uh, question. Another mistake that people make all the time is that they uh, start out a question uh, and don't follow it up. So they've got a good start to the uh cross-examination, uh, they've opened the door, but then they uh, leave it uh, shut. The negative, I want, uh, this was on the uh, LD, nuclear uh, weapons topic, the affirmative, uh, the negative in cross -ex, how do you abolish nuclear weapons? And the affirmative says, through space-time fiat. And then Ed Neg says, okay, and moves on. I was left to wonder, I have no idea what space-time fiat is. I would have loved to hear a, a follow-up question uh, on that. Um, also, in that round, they were talking about uh, nuclear weapons, and they said the first time uh, that we ever used nuclear weapons, we dropped the fat man on uh, Japan. And then they looked up at me, and they go, oh, sorry, Judge. And I was like, sad. Okay, tear. Uh, whenever you hear the you know question, what is the status of a counter plan? And someone says dispositional. You probably should follow up and say, you know, what does dispositionality mean? I heard, okay, what is the status of the counter plan? And the neg said, uh, I didn't run a counter plan. He actually definitely had run a counter plan. Uh, and the one I didn't follow up on that and didn't say, um, you have this counter plan right here. What is its status? Uh, you know, fortunately, that did not become relevant in that debate. Lots of times you will see people try to get the last word in, in cross-examination. They've been going back and forth, and, uh, you know, one of the teams will say, well, that's obviously stupid, but I need to move on. And then when the opposing team says, well, I don't think that that's obviously stupid, they inevitably, it's my cross-examination, uh, and try to move on. You don't get to have the last word uh, when your last word is an ad hominem attack, uh, that is not a question, right? Uh, the battle to get the last word uh, is infinitely regressive. It will go on forever uh, and is definitely, uh, you know, something that's not super fun to watch. Then sometimes you see people in cross-examination and they're trying to be subtle. Uh, they're asking a question like, is your plan popular? Uh, Ooh, might you have a uh, politics dissad in mind? Uh, I watched someone in cross-examination, the affirmative had uh, said something about war with China, uh, and the negative said, if we had a war right now with China, who would win? I thought, oh, that's subtle. Uh, they're running the China war good uh, disadvantage. Well, I spoke too soon. Uh, they actually ran the security critique. And again, I spoke too soon, they ran both the security critique and China war good. And then they went for both of those in the last speech. 
And then they argued with me for like 15 minutes after the round when I tried to explain that those two arguments were not consistent with each other. Uh, on the lethal autonomous weapons topic, that's a Lincoln Douglas topic that we just had. Negative stood up and said, what is a lethal autonomous weapon? And the F said, it's one that's controlled by robots and not by uh, humans. And so the negative says, well, what is a human? And the F was like, um, don't be a, don't be a jerk. You know, a human is a human. And the negative uh, says, well, so what's the difference between a human and a robot? And the F started to explain. And then the negative said, uh, are you a robot? And the F says, no. And the Meg says, well, how do you know? Uh, <laughs> which, wow, interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, raising a whole lot of Blade Runner type issues uh, was very subtle that they were running uh, the cyborg critique. Um, another thing that you see that is often a problem is when you are helping your partner. Your partner is answering the question and you don't think that they're doing a good job of it. So you interrupt to help your partner to improve the cross-examination. Um, in general, if you are the type of person who believes that only you have the correct answer, inevitably, you don't have the correct answer. It's amazing to me that most of the time that someone interrupts, they give a worse answer than the person was giving uh, in the first place. Uh, I watched a debate. Uh, it was uh, on the arm sales topic. And they said, uh, we're on, affirmative in the 1AC, it said, we're on the brink of war uh, with Iran. Uh, it'll be a hot war in the Middle East. A negative in cross-examination is, what is a hot war? Uh, and the 1A started to kind of talk about it, but, you know, didn't really know uh, what the definition of that was. So the 2A jumps in and says, it's a war in the Middle East, because the Middle East is hot, because it's a desert. And that is not what a hot war means. So uh, I can only imagine that they think that the Cold War was fought in Antarctica or something. Um, I watched... Uh, you know, a, a negative. They stood up and said, uh, you're one AC. You talk about, uh, Dutch disease. What is that? And the negatives, you know, the one A starts to answer and the two A interrupts and says, the Dutch, when they colonized West Africa, they gave diseases to the West Africans. Uh, and the one N said, is that right? And the one A goes, probably not. So I think they were, uh, used to it. Um, there are so many times when I watch a debate where my first impression is you should have flowed. Uh, because a lot of the cross-examinations are, did you read this card? Did you read this card? How many arguments did you make? What arguments did you make? Uh, and I'm left wondering, why didn't you flow the debate? Or even worse, they're looking at the speech document instead of flowing the debate and they don't even listen to see how far someone got in the speech document. So they've got the speech open in front of them, but still don't keep uh, touch with that. So I oftentimes think that you should flow. Uh, I heard a 1AC in cross X. I go, how many counter plans did you run? And I'm thinking you should have flowed. But the negative one up them and said, well, 1NC goes, I didn't count. Uh, which, all right, that's not, that's not great. That's not great. Okay. Um, a lot of times people will say, uh, will start out a uh, argument and say, what are your answers to? And then give an argument. Or what would you say if I said blah, blah, blah? Or uh, that's wrong. Uh, studies say this. What do you say to that? Or what do you think of the argument that says? Okay, so first of all, you're not really asking a question. Uh, you know, everyone kind of understands you're making an argument. You're just trying to phrase it as a question. Uh, that's not, you know, uh, that's not what you should be doing. You should be asking questions, not making arguments. Uh, but beyond that, this is terrible strategically. Uh, because, okay, well, first of all, most people's reaction to this is, I'm not going to tell you what my answers will be. Your reaction should be the opposite, right? Like if they stand up and say, uh, uh, what would you say if I said that the plan, you know, uh, caused 
uh, a massive backlash uh, from, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, the police. I would say, well, here are my 10 answers to the police backlash disad. You know, let me uh, just start and go on until uh, you stop me, right? Like you are turning their cross X time into your speech time. If you ask a question by making an argument and asking what their answers are, you are opening up your cross-examination for them to take it over and, you know, run with it. Why would you want to do that, right? Um, sometimes uh, cross-examination can get derailed. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, you want to keep going on the point you were trying to make and not get caught up in tangents, not get caught up addressing every minuscule detail of your opponent's uh, response. Uh, okay, here's an example of this. The uh, affirmative had used a phrase in their 1AC, uh, get all of your ducks in a row. And that's just a common phrase that means get everything organized. Uh, and the, the negative, in cross-examination asked, what does that mean? Get your ducks in the row. And the AF, you know, says, ducks fly in rows, which is not where the phrase comes from, but hold on. Because their opponent said, ducks can't fly. They said, uh, ducks absolutely fly. Uh, no, ducks can't fly. And then I jumped in and I said, no, it's true. Ducks do fly. And then the debater was like, you're thinking of geese. And I said, geese also fly, but ducks definitely fly. Um, this had to be, we stopped the debate to Google this. Uh, so that tells you what I do with my Saturday mornings. Okay, finally, you never want to get caught in cross-examination not knowing what your argument is, because that's going to make you look uh, bad. That's going to make you look unprepared. It's going to hurt your ethos. Uh on the immigration topic, uh, the negative in cross-examination was like, what is the model minority myth? And the AF said that Asians are better. And the negative said, what? And the AF goes, no, 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 no. It's Asians are worse. And uh, neither of those are, are the model minority myth. Um, in another round, the negative had run a McDonald's peace theory argument. And that's just a metaphor in uh, international economics that says no two countries that have McDonald's in them have ever gone to war. Uh, and it's supposed to say things like capitalism creates interrelationships between governments, which prevents conflicts. And so the cross excerpt was, are you saying that McDonald's has an army? And the negative says they don't even need one because they're trading with other nations, which causes peace. And the AF said, I don't understand that. And the NEG said, reassured him and said, no, this all makes sense. And that's where we ended that. At the middle school, Tournament of Champions, which in and of itself, oh my God. Uh, the AF in cross-examination of the 1NC. The 1NC had run uh, a critique. And the, the AF asked, what is your... Uh, you know, you know, what is your critique? And the next said, transhumanism. And the AF said, what does that say? Uh, and the next said, I don't know. My varsity partners just gave it to me and told me to read it. Uh, and so the AF said, please don't go for that. And the next said, don't worry, we're not going for it. Um, so, yeah, that's a good long list of uh, things that you should not do uh, during cross-examination. They're not rude. They're not offensive. Many of them are hilarious. Uh, but at the same time, they're not very effective uses of cross-examination. So I'm going to pause again right here to see if there are any questions. Uh, anybody written anything in the chat? No, I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, anybody, uh, anybody have anything that they want to know? Yes, no, maybe it's a, quite, it's a lecture about cross-examination. So questions, you know. Okay, well, uh, I, I will soldier on. Okay, we've covered the things that are ugly, the things you should never do because they are offensive. 
uh, and then we've covered the things that are bad. Uh, you know, it's not offensive, but it's also not helping you uh, to get better in cross-examination. So what should you do during cross-examination? How can you go on the offensive? How can you engage your opponent? How can you aggressively pursue your position uh, during cross-examination? And I want to focus on three skills. Setting up arguments, setting up questions, and reading evidence aloud. If you use these three skills during cross-examination, I, I think I can promise you that you will improve enormously or drastically. You will get better speaker points and it will help you win debates, okay? So let's talk about each of these techniques. The first is that you need to set up a question. Lots of times people jump in with their final question. Uh, they uh, start out with the thing that they were needed to lead up to. Um, so if you were talking about, uh, say, uh, a uh, defund the police affirmative, and you wanted to set up the argument that uh, the police would backlash against that, and that then with less funding, the only people who would, the police that would be left would be the ones with more seniority who are the ones who are more abusive. So if you start out the cross-examination with that final question, you haven't set up the arguments step by step to ask the argument or ask the question effectively. So if you start out by saying, your affirmative is going to really upset the police, and it's only going to be the police who have tenure left after all this defunding. Won't they uh, be more violent as a backlash against uh, the affirmative plan? Instead, set up your question by asking steps along the way. So in order to set up the idea that the police will backlash against it, you might say, uh, okay, you're defunding the police uh, proposal. Why isn't it happening right now? What does your inherency evidence say? And they'll start to talk about so on and so on. And you say, yeah, your inherency evidence says police unions are opposed to it, right? Yes. Okay, so the police are opposed to this plan, right? Yes. Uh, now, how, do, how are police promoted? Uh, I don't know what you're asking. Well, police contracts generally have seniority clauses, right? Well, sure, if you'd say so. And a seniority clause says if you're going to fire someone, the people who have been there the longest generally get to keep their jobs, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when you defund the police, who's most likely to get fired? Well, uh, I don't know. It's the younger police, right? Yes. Now, you have walked them up to that question by asking small step questions so that they can't really argue with that final question. As a matter of fact, I don't think you need to ask the final question at that point. Uh, I want to use uh, an example of this. Uh, it is from... Uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, My Cousin Vinny. Uh, and in this movie, he does a very good job of asking questions that are small questions that set up his final point. So I'm going to play this now. Sacks. What do we call these big things? 
Praise. Trees, that's right. Don't get afraid to shout them right out when you know. Now, what are these thousands of little things that are on trees? Leaves. And these bushy things between the trees. Bushes. So, Mr. Craig, you could positively identify the defendants for a moment of two seconds looking through this very window, this crud covered screen, these trees with all these leaves on them, and I don't know how many bushes. Like that. <laughs> don't forget this one and this one. Seven bushes. Seven bushes. So, what do you think? Is it possible you just saw two guys in a green convertible? Not necessarily these two particular guys. I suppose. I'll finish with this guy. I mean, what I love about uh, hey, no. what I love about that is that it is uh, it's a it's a textbook of how you can walk your your uh the person answering the questions up to the point that makes your argument if you start out with how can you be sure that it is my two you know d uh clients and not just did you have a good view you're not going to get the same kind of answer uh the best part about this is that He's already admitted every step along the way. That final question doesn't, it doesn't matter what he says as his answer to it. It might even hurt him if he says, no, I had a perfect view because that would undermine his credibility. I don't even think he needs to ask that final question because uh, it was set up so well. Uh, now, I watch this... Uh, uh, I always watch this YouTube channel by this guy who goes and uh, talks, he's a lawyer and he talks about movies. And he says that My Cousin Vinny is actually the most accurate legal comedy uh, he's ever seen. That, that kind of lawyering, that kind of questioning is really uh, effective. He says, I absolutely love what Joe Pesci is doing here. He's, a he's using incontrovertible evidence. No one's going to dispute what these things are in the photos, but he's walking the witness down a logical path that he's not going to be able to get out of. Uh, that is the sign of a masterful cross-examination. I would recommend all lawyers watch this particular cross-examination of this witness. And I recommend that every debate coach show My Cousin Vinny. First, awesome movie. Fantastic. Marissa Tomei hits it out of the park. Uh, but beyond that, it also gives a an absolutely fantastic lesson in how to do uh, cross-examination. Now, the second uh, thing that you want to do is to set up arguments. Uh, what's the difference between what I just said, setting up a question and setting up an argument? Well, um, like I said in that last one, you're using questions to set up, you know, a final question. You don't even need to ask that final question uh, because it's practically an argument. You can do that, set up arguments for your later speech during the cross-examination. You can use all of the cross-examination to take out parts of a position but you're not making the arguments during cross-examination. You're setting them up so that later on, your partner or you in the speech can make those arguments. Nothing is more soul-crushing to a judge than to watch someone do a fantastic job in cross-examination, and then we never hear about those arguments later on in the debate. So what I'm talking about here is how you use cross-examination to set up arguments that you're going to make later on in your speeches. So how can you do that? Well, you can ask questions uh, that are going to set up 
where you point out the flaws and weaknesses of their arguments. Uh, in particular, you can do that about their evidence. You can highlight flaws in the uh, quality of their author, the dates of their evidence, the uh, the wording of the evidence itself. Or you can ask about the weak link in the chain of events. In particular, lots of times people will cut down their argument uh, in order to be able to make it into the 1NC or the 1AC, and they've left out a link or two, an internal link in the chain of events for their disadvantage. Asking about what is there helps you identify later on what is not there, which then becomes an argument later on in the debate when you say that there's no internal link to the disadvantage. Remember the cross-examination where he went from point A to point C but forgot B. Uh, another thing that you can do to uh, set up an argument is to ask follow-up questions. Remember earlier on where I said, uh, I want to hear follow-up questions to something. Um, so how will you abolish nuclear weapons? I will use space-time fiat. What exactly is space-time fiat? Well, it's where the affirmative gets to change the reality of uh, the world in order to make it so that the... So it's just that you're fiating that it occurs, right? Yes, that is. Uh, all right, now you have uh, fiated that countries abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, are how are you going to prevent them from rebuilding those weapons? Okay, and now you have set up what their argument, you've asked a follow-up question to set up what their argument is so they can't change it into something else. Use follow-up questions to lock down what their argument is and therefore what their argument is not. I actually don't recommend making that argument during the cross-examination because, as I pointed out earlier, then all you're really doing is turning it over to your opponent to allow them to answer the question. Finally, once, once you have set up an argument, you have to actually make the argument in a speech. As soon as the... Uh, 1NC is done crossing, or the uh, 2NC is done cross-exiting the 1NC, or 1AC, those two should converse for 15 seconds and say, is there anything that you got in cross-ex that you want me to put in my speech? Similarly, the 2AC has to talk to the 1N, 1A after they've cross-examined the 1NC to say, is there anything that you got in cross-examination that I should be putting into my speech? because you always want to be able to make that argument in an actual speech. Okay, uh, in order to do this, I, I, I want to use an example. Uh, I want to uh, show you a, an argument that is backed up by a piece of evidence. Uh, the evidence is underlined and highlighted uh, to make an argument. And I want to see how you would cross-examine this piece of evidence. Now, admittedly, this is about the Trump disadvantage, so it's out of date. I know that. That's because this lecture written last summer. The, the point of the argument has nothing to do with whether this is still a timely argument or not. The point of the exercise is to see how you would ask questions in the cross-examination. So I'm going to give you a minute to look through uh, this evidence, and then uh, I would like it if you would type your questions into the cross or into the chat, and we'll go over uh, how they can be improved for cross examination. So I'm gonna uh, give you. I got a timer here. I'm gonna set the timer for a minute, and during that time, I'd like it if everyone would uh, type their cross X question into chat.
Okay. Uh, let me take a look at the chat and see what we have there. All right. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Um, well, that was the audience participation part of the speech. Uh, tell you what, I can demonstrate how I would cross-examine this. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to lock down what the evidence says and therefore what the evidence doesn't say. So I would say, okay, uh, your Jin evidence says only a perceived loss causes Trump to commit to a trade deal. So this, your argument is that if uh, Trump starts losing popularity, he will do a trade deal with China, right? Yes, that's what our thing. Okay, so let's read this evidence. Trump needs China's cooperation on the phase one trade deal or a military conflict to take his chances of winning re-election later this year over 50%. Trump currently only has a 30% chance of being reelected in November uh, against Democratic presidential nominee Biden uh, studied previous uh, presidential uh, elections. Trump may take extreme measures. He could either expand international cooperation or he could opt for extreme military conflicts. Uh, Trump could pull the U.S. into a military conflict to boost his chances of re-election. All right, uh, so my first question here is that this says that Trump will do anything if his popul if his chances of being re-elected re go under 50%, right? Yes, uh, we read that out loud. Now, the un-underlying part of the card uh, says that he is already under 30 per He is currently only has a... 30% chance of being reelected in November, right? Yes, okay. Uh, now, you're saying that this card says it could lead to a trade deal. Yes. Doesn't it also say that a Trump loss could lead to a military conflict? No, 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 it would be a trade deal where, blah, blah, I'd say, well, we read your card. It said on the phase one trade deal or a military conflict. It says he may take extreme measures, he could either expand international cooperation or he could opt for extreme military conflicts. Well, so on, so on. He would choose the trade thing because. And then just let him go ahead and talk about, you know, his argument about, his or her argument about why uh, Trump would choose the trade one. You've already made your point. You are able to read the card slowly, right? Like no one's going to get that if, uh, you know, that much detail if you read it at top speed. But if you read the card slowly, you can highlight, you know, and the judge hears the parts of the card that don't support your opponent's argument, okay? Uh, and you have set up two arguments. You've set up the argument that it's non-unique. He's already below 50%. And you've set up an argument that, uh, that a a loss for Trump would actually be a catastrophic thing because it would lead to a military conflict. Or at very least, it has just as much chance of a military conflict as a trade deal. You then need to make those arguments in the uh, 2AC. You would need to say, non-unique. Trump is already below 30 per, uh, 50%. He currently only has a 30% chance of being reelected. That's the cross-examination about their link evidence. Uh, and then you would also need to say impact turn. Their evidence doesn't say it will lead to a trade deal. It says it could either be a trade deal or a military conflict, one of which is a terrible thing. So you want to, you want to set up the argument, and then you want to make the argument later. Okay. Uh, the last uh, strategy or the last technique that I want to talk about is reading evidence aloud. Uh, lots of times when people are uh, debating and just starting debate, they're like, I don't know how to fill up my uh, speech, my cross X time. You know, I, I don't have any more questions to ask. Uh, so I'll end my cross X 
early. And some people think that that's like impressive. I'll waive cross-examination uh, and I'll say, okay, well, that was uh, three minutes out of your uh, total of 16 minutes of speaking that you just got a zero on. So we're starting your points at 26. Uh, use your speech time. Cross-X is a speech time. Use that time. So people have a hard time sometimes, uh, you know, figuring out how do I fill my speech time. On the other hand, some people have too much stuff that they want to do in cross-examination. They say, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to, I want to hit this disad, I want to point out their link problems, I want to, uh, you know, cross-examine their, uh, you know, find out what the status of this is. I want to argue about uh, their interpretation on top. They want to do everything during cross-examination. And I'm going to suggest that the best thing that you can do during cross-examination is focus in on one or two arguments that are key arguments and then go super in-depth in them, which requires reading evidence aloud, right? Like, let's say that the only thing you do during cross X is go over one piece of evidence, but that piece of evidence is the key internal link in your opponent's disad. Your partner now only has to make four or five seconds worth of answers to that disadvantage because it's gone, right? That's the Corey, uh, you know, that, that's an Andy Ryan strategy, you know? Make it so that they can't even go for this argument after... Uh, the cross-examination. Make it so that they would look like that character from My Cousin Vinny if he had said, no, 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 I had a good view, right? If you do a good job going cross in depth in cross-examination into one part of one argument, but make that argument go away, you've done a good job during cross-examination. In order to do that, in order to go in depth, you have to read evidence aloud. Now, uh, in the last example with that Jin evidence, uh, that was a good example of how you would read evidence aloud uh, to set up arguments. Um, you don't want to just say, what does your evidence say? Or what does your argument say? Because then you're turning over the cross X to your opponent, right? If you say, what is your argument? If they're... Uh, halfway decent, they're going to explain in full everything about their argument. So you've basically just given them another two minutes to explain something that might not have been clear the first time through. Or if you ask them, what does your evidence say? Or where does your evidence say this? They're going to sit and explain their evidence the best way possible. Or they're going to go uh, to their card and say, here's the line that is most important. Let me read that out loud to you. So sometimes people say, read me a line from your evidence that says blah, blah, blah. And never say, can you read your evidence out loud and then ask questions about it. You want to be the person who reads the evidence out loud to set up your argument for at least three reasons. The first is, you want to read all of it, not just the parts that they think are important. That means the highlighted part, sometimes it means the underlined part, and sometimes it means the ununderlined part. If you turn it over to your opponent, they're going to read the part that they think helps them the most. You will find gold mines of arguments in the ununderlined portions of evidence. The second is that by reading it out loud and reading everything out loud, you make it so they can't say, no, 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 this evidence is about blah, blah, blah. You go, I read your entire card out loud. It did not say anything about so on and so on. Uh, the third reason is, is an ethos point. If you're turning over the evidence to them to read out loud or asking them, read a line from your evidence or saying, where does your evidence say? They get to put it in the best terms possible for them you get to put it in the best terms possible for you. That's not only an argumentative point, that's an ethos point. That makes the judge want to vote for you. If someone is reading the card slowly and focusing on the key words, you want that person to be you because that person's gonna get better points. So we're gonna do another example here. 
I'm going to move this. Trump is losing now. Again, this is the Trump just said, sorry. Trump is losing now, but he still has a chance. Strauss, 2020, Guardian, USA, senior political reporter. Now, if you ask your opponent and say, where's your evidence that says that Trump's going to win? They're going to say, the Strauss evidence talks about how uh, he's winning with on the economy and uh, suburban swing voters. Uh, the economy is the top priority. Uh, you know, if he has a pathway, uh, it's through the economy. So, uh, you know, he's going to lose now because the economy isn't going great. But if he does the affirmative plan, that's going to change people's minds and bring them back over to him. Now, you've basically let your opponent explain not only what their card says, but what their argument says. You've let them assert that this card helps us. By contrast, if you say, show me the line that says Trump is losing now, and they'll say, most national and statewide polls show Biden leading Trump often by comfortable margins. Okay? And that's all they're going to read to you. So you don't have the ability to, you know, make arguments about it. Instead, read their evidence for them and then ask questions. Okay, so this is your evidence, your uniqueness evidence, saying that Trump is going to lose now, but he still has a chance. Yes. Okay. If Donald Trump wins, uh, it won't be by a landslide. And if he's going to win, he will need the U.S. economy to rebound, to see suburban voters swing back in his direction and overwhelm voters with a sense of optimism about another term. That's the verdict about a dozen Republican veteran political strategists and operatives spoken to by The Guardian. Most national and statewide polls show Biden leading Trump by comfortable margins. Trump, he has struggled uh, to offer consistent leadership on the coronavirus and has been lambasted for his mishandling, a pandemic that has killed more than 120,000 Americans. The resulting economic crisis has seen more than 40 million people make unemployment claims and receive severe criticism in responding to protests over the death of uh, George Floyd. The economy is a top priority, followed by whether Trump can win over key voting constituencies beyond his base. Uh, the it's the economy stupid and for the operatives who see a hidden path for a trump victory it's through the economy if we have an economy in which employment goes back down to five percent or below if we have a dow that is above forty thousand, then people are going to give him credit okay so my first question is that your argument is that trump is losing now right yes uh, and your evidence does say that. Biden is leading by comfortable margins. Yes, exactly. Then your, your argument is that if he does something on uh, criminal justice reform, that that's going to swing suburban voters back in his direction, right? Yes, my evidence talks about how people are criticizing him over the uh, protests over the death of George Floyd. Okay. So your argument is that the affirmative plan makes him popular on criminal justice reform, which will help him win the election, right? Yes. So criminal justice reform is the key issue, right? Yes. All right. But your card says that if he's going to win at all, he will need the economy to rebound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The economy is doing badly. That's why he needs uh, to win. He needs a win on criminal justice reform. And I'd say, no. The, your evidence says that the economy is the top priority and that it's the economy, stupid, that the economy is the hidden path for Trump. It's through the economy. Well, but the other way in which he could do that would be uh, to, um, uh, you know, to improve on criminal justice reform. And I would say, okay, well, then your evidence says that the Unemployment needs to go back down below 5% or the Dow needs to be above 40% for him to win. Does the plan do either of those things? No, no, no. It's about criminal justice reform. Uh, your evidence is also about how he was criticized for lack of leadership on the coronavirus and he was been lambasted for handling of, of the pandemic. Does your plan prevent anyone from dying of the coronavirus? No. Okay, now I'm done. 
You have set up a bunch of arguments, non-unique coronavirus, non-unique economy, and uh, that his evidence doesn't, his or her evidence doesn't make the argument that criminal justice reform is the most important issue. And there's absolutely no way a judge, after hearing, if he's going to win, he will need the U.S. economy to rebound. It's the economy, stupid. The economy is the top priority. If we have an economy which goes uh, back down or below, people are going to give him credit. There's no way a judge could listen to that and be swayed by, you know, a, a crafty 2NC or reading more internal link evidence. You have read enough of their evidence to say, here's what it says, and here's what it doesn't say, and I have enough arguments from your own evidence, including the parts you didn't read out loud in cross-examination. Uh, you know, I have enough arguments from your own evidence uh, to take out your dissent. I think most people would find that enough, a very effective use of cross-examination. That asks follow-up questions. It focuses on what the evidence says and what it doesn't say. It locks down key phrases from the evidence. It sets up uh, questions and then uses those questions to set up arguments. It builds ethos. It cuts down on the amount of time that the 2AC has to spend on this argument. That's what you want to do in cross-examination. And that's what I mean by going on the offense in cross-examination. That's what I mean about being aggressive or dogged during cross-examination. Uh, it doesn't mean trying to shout down your opponent or cut them off or dominate the cross-ex. It means following up questions to a point where the argument you don't even need to make during cross-examination. All right. Uh, I want to... I'm done, so if people have questions, I'd like to answer them now. You can put that in the chat, or you could uh, just log in. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask or answer? All right. Oh, uh, can the cutting off demeaning language be used as an argument against the other team in later speeches? I doubt it. I mean, yeah, there are people who do that. Uh, but I think that it's much more effective when... Uh, it's much more effective when it doesn't seem to be something that you're trying to win off of, right? Like if someone really is aggressive and demeaning to you, it kind of cheapens it for you to say, I should win because my opponent said this, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't run, uh, you know, critiques off of language. You know, my opponent used uh, offensive language. They used patriarchal language. They used racist language. They used ableist language. There are lots of critiques that you can run that do that. But the kind of thing that I'm talking about... Uh, I, I'm not sure is necessarily uh, the kind of thing you would run a language critique on. And I think, in general, you're better off just saying, uh, don't be so rude. I will answer your questions, but you got uh, you got to give me a chance to answer them. Uh, if you escalate it and say, uh, you're a jerk, blah, 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 in cross-examination, well, then, then, then no one's having any fun. Uh I think you kind of have to trust the judges that if they see someone being abusive during cross-examination, that not only does it help your ethos uh, in terms of points, but it would also help your ability to win. Like if I see someone being a jerk in cross-ex, I'm looking for ways to vote against them. I can't promise that will always work, but I do say that, uh, I, I would say that um, making it an argument is difficult because... Uh, you know, it, it makes it seem like you're not really offended by it. You just want to win. And I'm not saying that you are. 
Uh, I'm saying that that kind of is the way it could be perceived. Okay, uh, do you do the card activity with your students? How do you instruct cross-examination? Excellent questions. First of all, yes, I do the card activity with uh, students almost every uh, practice round that we have. I'll say, okay, here's how you could have done this cross-examination of this card uh, differently. But we also have a specific, I'll give them a card and uh, pretend that I am the one who read the card and then uh, we go around the room and people start to do cross-examinations of me uh, and you know, see who can lock me down uh, the best. And, and after each of their questions, what I try to do is say, here's the part you did right and here's how you could improve it. Don't ask this. This is, an, this is an argument disguised as a question. How could you divide that up into set up questions? And do you need to ask this last uh, thing? Or if someone, 99% uh, of the time when you do a cross-sex drill on evidence with uh, debaters, uh, they look at the author and the date. And they're like, okay, isn't your card really old? And you want to say, okay, are there other things within the evidence that are more important, perhaps, than the date or the quals or something like that. Um, how do I instruct cross-examination? Well, first of all, most of it occurs during uh, practice debates. And I do a lot of practice debates, like uh, two or three a week. Um, and one of the things that I emphasize during the uh, practice debates are the cross-examinations. I, I will almost every practice debate stop them at some time during the cross section and say, here's how we could do this one a little bit better. Here's how this question would work a little bit differently. Uh, here are some drills I do for cross-examination. There's the card uh, drill. Um, there's the big cross X. And what I mean by that is uh, when we are starting the year or in Lincoln Douglas, when you're starting a topic and the affirmative or the negative case or the disad or the critique is new, what I'll do is I'll choose someone and say, okay, you're on the hotspot for uh, 30 minutes. Everyone is going to cross X you. And you have nowhere to hide. You can't run out the time in cross X because, you know, we'll, we'll make it an hour if things are going well. That does a couple of things. The first is uh, it teaches the uh, questioning skills, but it also helps people learn their cases really in depth because you figure out, okay, here are the kinds of things people are going to ask me in cross X. Maybe I better go find this out, right? Uh, if you're, uh, you know, on the Lincoln Douglas topic about lethal autonomous weapons. And someone says, uh, give me an example of a lethal autonomous weapon. And you say, uh, a killer robot. And they say, any others? And you go, mm, I don't know. Okay, that's something I better go look at, right? Uh, or if uh, one of the things, one of your pieces of evidence say that the Chemical Weapon Convention, you know, is an empirical example of how a ban on uh, nuclear weapon or on lethal autonomous weapons can solve. And in Cross X, someone says, when was the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, passed? And you go, I don't know. Well, that tells you something about what you better go look up. Or if you get caught in a trap during cross-examination, because there's lots of traps in cross-examination. You know now how to avoid the trap. Uh, but overall, that cross-examination is focused more on how to answer questions and how to know enough about your case in order to do uh, cross-examinations. Um, another thing that I do is mini debates where we'll take a specific issue, uh, like, uh, you know, I'll give uh, people a 1NC shell for a disad and a 2AC block on it, and they will do cr back and forth cross-examinations. The affirmative will cross-ex the 1NC shell, the uh, negative will cross-examine the 2AC arguments. And so it's, it's, it's focused, and we don't need to take the time to do the actual speeches. Instead, we just get straight to uh, the cross-examination. Uh, we sometimes, uh, in, in lab, we made it into a game and we played King of the Hill. Uh, someone would be in the middle of the, the circle and they would ask questions until either Sarah or I said, ding, you just got beaten in cross X. And then someone else would take their uh, place in cross X. So it was kind of like uh, King or Queen of the Mountain, although it was more like the mush pot than it was anything else. Um, so... Uh, those are some of the things that I, I, I try to do to do cross-examination. The most helpful ones are the practice rounds and the big cross-ex. All right. Uh, those are really good questions. Does anybody 
have any other questions or uh, I know I'm a little bit over time. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Uh, enjoy the rest of the expo.